Hello, logging on everyone. Uh, hi, and welcome to this Growing Manchester Soil Science webinar um, with guests presenter this week, Claudia. So Claudia ran the brilliant compost and vermiculture webinar for us a few weeks ago, uh, which you can find a recording of on our Vimeo page. Claudia is a volunteer coordinator at Platfield's Market Garden uh, in South Manchester, which is a nice big community market garden, where she helps to lead volunteer sessions and gets involved in organising and hosting events. My name is Emily and I am from Social Enterprise So The City, based in Manchester as well. This webinar is part of a programme we, we run, which is funded by the NHS called Growing Manchester. The aims of this project are to improve access to sustainable food in Manchester and increase the health and well-being of the wider community. So I checked and this is number 15 in our long list of webinars now. So we've run all these over the recent lockdown period, um, which has been going on for a while now in the UK. And uh, yeah, we're all a bit fed up of it, but it's great to be able to speak to and connect with people while we can't um, meet with them for community sessions. So what we've run webinars on all sorts of topics around growing food, nature, community and sustainability. More recently on hydroponics, vertical farming, fermenting foods, growing mushrooms, urban trees, beekeeping, but loads and loads of variation. So you can find these recordings on the So The City Vimeo page. And if you want any more information or a PDF copy of any of the presentations, you can just send me an email on info at so the city .org. I'll pass over to Claudia now. Her presentation will cover the components and importance of soil and soil life, as well as different soil types and how best to work with them in your own garden or community garden setting. Okay, yeah, hello everyone, I'm Claudia. Um, yeah, I'm, I've just uh, finished my environmental science degree and I'm very interested in soil science specifically. So I am here today to talk to you about some um, basic soil science that I think every gardener should know. So what you will learn today, uh, you will learn how soil is formed. You'll learn how soil, uh, what soil is actually made of and the functions of its components. Um, we'll talk about the most common types of soil that you might work with in your garden and we'll talk about the science behind these and their advantages and disadvantages and i'll also finish with a few general tips on how we can promote soil health in your garden so how is soil actually formed so how this happens is uh, you will have a rock <laughs> and this and this rock will be called the parent rock or the parent material and this is the source of the soil or of the mineral part of it anyway. So what happens over time is that the rock gets weathered and this means that various processes will act on this rock and slowly break it down into smaller and smaller bits that will eventually make up the soil particles. And these processes can be biological. So for example, you, you can have um, plants that will excrete these like organic acids through the plant roots, which will wear away and dissolve the rock over time. The processes can be chemical, which is similar to the last one where you have acids or gases or water that will dissolve the rock over time. And this can happen with uh, through the action of rain because rain is slightly acidic. Um, these weathering processes can also be physical. So you can, um, if you imagine um, waves bashing against a wall of rock for decades and decades of time, that rock will simply get worn away. Or another example of this is um, tree roots or plant roots entering cracks in the rock and just breaking it apart slowly. And the process of soil formation is not quick. Uh, depending on the conditions in a particular climate, like the temperature and amount of rainfall, um, it's estimated it takes 200 years or at least 200 years to form just one centimetre of soil, which is a ridiculously long amount of time. And actually, interestingly enough, because um, the Philippines, they have there's a very uh, warm climate with a lot of rainfall and that's actually quite uh, favorable to high weathering rates so you'll get more weathering of soils in a climate like that and yeah it's just scary that like the thing we rely on for our food and to grow fibers for our clothes takes that long to form 
And it's really easy to lose that soil, especially due to all the destructive practices that our world is partaking in right now, like deforestation and any harmful agricultural practices. And I'm not saying this to scare anyone at all, but it's just to point out how important it is that we preserve our soils. Um, so the soil profile. So don't get too uh, into the details of this because it's not super relevant for gardening. I think it's just interesting to know. So as the soil forms, you get something called the soil profile which as you can see is um, like if, if, you were cut through, if you were to cut through your soil to get a cross section of it, you see it's made of a variety of layers, each layer having different components, different functions. And as the parent rock or the parent material, the source of soil, like I just mentioned, will be at the very bottom. And all these different layers will kind of stack up on top until you get to the very top where you have a layer that is filled with organic matter and that's where we grow our crops. So there's a lot more to soil than meets the eye. Um, yeah, so what actually is soil? So soil is very complex. It's not just one thing. It consists of many components that all have very important functions. So as you can see in this diagram, this is what a soil particle can actually look like. So what you have here, you've got minerals like quartz and clay, uh, clay minerals. You have organic matter microbes and soil animals and air and water. And we're just gonna look into these in a bit more detail right now. So minerals, minerals provide some of the nutrients in the soil. So whether it's uh, larger minerals that get weathered and broken down into tiny, tiny bits until they can be taken up by the plants, or it refers to minerals that are already available to be taken up in, uh, by the plant from the soil. So like potassium, magnesium, uh, phosphorus, for example. And or as I will talk about later, you also have clay minerals that can actually control how available other nutrients are in the soil because these clay minerals can kind of hold on to these nutrients. And I'll talk about that a bit more in, uh, later on. Uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of organic matter, so that organic matter refers to the stuff that was once alive and is now dead. So any like dead roots, fallen leaves, branches, decomposed food or compost or dead organisms and their waste. So that's what organic matter is. And organic matter uh, provides food for the plethora of soil life that we find in our soils. So they eat it and then they excrete it. And for this, they are basically breaking it down into smaller and smaller bits. They are extracting any remaining nutrients out of that organic matter and making it into a form that's more available for the plants to use uh, so they can grow nice and healthy. And this is how compost and hummus are actually made. So compost refers to the more kind of man-made man -made decomposed matter. So if you have your own compost heap where you'll throw all your garden and food waste that decomposes after a while, that's compost because it's kind of mediated by us humans, whereas hummus uh, refers to that same process of decomposition, but it just happening naturally in the soils without our input. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but hummus and compost are the same thing, basically. Um, so it feeds soil life, provides nutrients. Uh, the organic matter also promotes water retention and soil structure. This is because it fluffs up the soil and for this it, it provides air spaces that allow oxygen to flow through the soil. So that allows the roots to breathe and the oxygen also stimulates aerobic bacteria or bacteria that prefer uh, the presence of oxygen, which are great at uh, decomposing things. And these spaces also allow water to move through the soil um, freely so it, so it can reach plant roots, hydrate them and also supply the plant with any nutrients that may be dissolved in that water. So soil life. So <clears throat> another component of soil is soil life. Which is a very, it's a very, very impor important component. Uh, and this refers to the millions and millions of bacteria, fungi, and any little animals that live in our soil. So earthworms are a great example of this. They are known as ecosystem engineers because the movement through the soil is so important for its um, function, for its structure. So the movement through the soil will form channels that, like I mentioned earlier, earlier they will provide airflow and water movement throughout the soil. Um, soil life is key to decomposition. Again, like I just mentioned, they break down stuff that was once alive and this allows for nutrients to be reused by wherever it grows next. But uh, soil life also provides nutrients in other ways. So a really popular example of this is nitrogen fixing bacteria, which I'm sure most of you will have heard of. So these nitrogen fixing bacteria in plants, they live in a symbiotic relationship 
uh, so bacteria will live in, in, in a symbiotic relationship with plants like beans and peas and any like legumes. And a symbiotic relationship means that basically the two organisms, uh, they kind of depend on each other to survive. And the bacteria, what they do is they'll capture nitrogen present in the soil that's in a form that the plants can't use, and they convert it into a form that the plant can use. And as a reward, the bacteria get sugar back from the plant, which they use for energy. And a similar example of this is fungi. So uh, it's estimated that up to 90% of all plants have a symbiotic relationship with fungi. Um, and the fungal hyphae, which refers to these white fuzzy hairs that you may see in this photo, hopefully, they act as an extent extension of the plant's root system. So this allows the plant to expand its range from which it can get nutrients and water, and then the fungi will get sugars back in return for energy. Air and water, so air stimulates decomposition. Like I mentioned earlier, the microbes that are best at decomposition tend to be aerobic, meaning they like the presence of oxygen compared to anaerobic bacteria, which don't like oxygen. Um, and yeah, the air provides oxygen to the plant roots, so the plant roots can breathe, and the water you know, hydrates the roots, supplies nutrients that are dissolved in the water, and uh, water will also promote a new weathering of minerals, which with time will provide nutrients to the plant, again, like I mentioned earlier. So, soil types. Um, so now we can talk about the common uh, types of soil that you'll come across as a gardener. So the simplest way to classify soils is based on the size of the soil particles. So as you can see on the in the diagram on the left, uh, in red, the clay minerals are the smallest. Then in yellow, you've got silt, which is a bit bigger, and then sand in blue, which is the biggest one. And then at the bottom, you can see loam, which is just a mix of all three soil types. So now I'm going to talk about these in a bit more detail. And just to note here that if I'm referring to clay soil or sandy soil or like heavy clay, heavy sand soil, I'm not talking about soil that is 100% just clay or sand, but soil that is dominated by either clay or sand. So, for example, a heavy clay soil will be something that's 60% clay and then 20% silt, 20% sand. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, there are other soil types. So, for example, there are peat soils and chalky soils. But because they're not super common, uh, I'm not going to talk about those today. So, clay. Um, so, clay soils are dominated by clay minerals, and these are the smallest particles out of the three uh, soil types we're going to talk about today. Um, so, clay soils have issues with water infiltration, meaning that water can't move through these soils very well. And this is because, as you can see in these two diagrams, um, the structure of a clay mineral is like a plate. So these tiny plates will kind of stack up, as you can see in the top diagram. Um, they stack up and then there's, a, there's not really any space for water to move through that soil. So clay soils are prone to water logging because the water has nowhere to go. Um, because of this plate structure, clay soils are also prone to compaction. So any heavy rains, machinery or free, like frequently, frequently walking over clay soils can promote compaction, which can um, further restrict water movement. And compaction prevents roots from penetrating the soil enough and growing as they should. As you can see in this photo from a study I found, which I feel like this specifically is a bit of an extreme example of what happens to the roots, but you know, you get the picture of what happens. Um, and yeah, so clay soils are prone to water logging in the winter, and, then, and they're also prone to drying out in the summer, which is an issue similar to compaction because the soil gets very hard and the plant roots can't really spread out. So are clay soils actually good for anything? Well, yes, yes, they are. Uh, they're great at capturing nutrients, and this is because of their chemical makeup. So clay minerals are negatively charged. So you know how in chemistry, there's certain things will have a positive charge or a negative charge. Clay minerals have a negative charge. And as you might know, opposites attract. So clay minerals with their negative, uh, negative charge will attract any nutrients in the soil that are positively charged. So magnesium and potassium, for example. Um, and these minerals are then held onto by that clay, which prevents them from being washed away by water and just being lost from the soil. Um, and the way these nutrients then get used up by plants is that the plants will release these uh, 
acidic chemicals throughout the roots, which then cause the nutrients to be freed from that clay mineral, and then they can be taken up by the plant. Uh, so, working with clay soils. So, if how do you deal with predominantly clay soils? So you'd think that to make clay uh, clay soil easier to deal with, you would add something like sand, you know, because clays is, clay soils are so small, uh, sandy soils have bigger particles, you just kind of make sense to mix them up. But actually, apparently, if you mix clay and sand, you'll get something similar to concrete. <laughs> so do not do that. Uh, instead, you should add organic matter, whether it's something like compost, leaf mulch, you know, whatever, you can dig this into the soil, which is hard work and apparently will take years and years to see any actual improvements. Or what I would do personally, I would just add compost on top of on top of that soil and just build it up rather than dig it in. And then similar to that, you could build raised garden beds again, just kind of building um, soil on top of the more difficult difficult soil that you have. Or another thing you can do is you can just Google any suitable plants to grow in clay soils. So for example, uh, for ex sorry, <laughs> so apparently jasmine and cotton easter are quite good at uh, growing in clay soils. And there was a whole list of these plants. So um, yeah, there's a lot of pl uh, plants that can tolerate these conditions. Um, next we have silt. Yes, yeah, so uh, in terms of size, silt is uh, kind of a medium size compared to clay and sand. And silt refers to any material that is carried by running water. So this is stuff that you would find either floating in the river or deposited at the bottom of the riverbed. And these soils are really fertile because often the source of silt in soils, uh, the, the source of silt is soils that used to be on hills or slopes that with time kind of get washed away and eroded away into these channels, into these water bodies. So you just have this accumulation of really fertile soil. And similar to clays, they retain, they retain moisture and are prone to compaction due to the small size of the silt particles. Um, however, you're, you're unlikely to have heavy silt soils. Uh, they're not very common. So I won't talk about how to work with this kind of soil, but I assume you'd work with it in the same way you'd work with clay. Um, next, we've got sand. So sand has the largest soil particles out of the three uh, soil types and the most common mineral uh, that sand is made of is called silica and its most common form of that mineral in nature is quartz which I'm sure you, you've all heard of. So unlike clay sand is not good at holding water as you can see in these photos uh, sand particles are quite large they're semi-round and <clears throat> sandy soils will leave plenty of spaces for water and air to move through which avoids waterlogging, but also means that sandy soil isn't good at holding onto water because it'll just throw through the soil or dry up before the plant has a chance to use it. Um, sandy soils are also not good at holding onto nutrients just because of their chemical composition. They're just not able to grab onto anything the way clay does. But a good thing about these soils is that they warm up faster in the spring compared to clay soils, which gives you a head start when it comes to planting stuff out. Um, so to work with sandy soils, um, so like I said earlier, you don't want to mix clay and sand because you might get some concrete like thing, but you just want to add organic matter instead. And again, you can either dig it in or build it on top. I would just save myself the work and build on top. Um, you can also use slow release fertilizers in these soils because like I said, they're quite poor in nutrients. So you want some kind of fertilizer that will last you quite a long time. Um, also, apparently with sandy soils, it's good to water less frequently, but for longer. So you have you want to like properly hydrate the soil as apparently this can promote plant roots to grow deeper. And the deeper you go, the more water is available for the plants because it all just collects lower down. Um, you can also use mulch to prevent water from evaporating from the soil and keeping that moisture in. So I'll talk about mulch uh, later on. And again, you'd want to use plants that are appropriate for soils that are, you know, dry and nutrient poor. So forsythia and lavender are good at the, uh, good for this, apparently. And yeah, if you Google uh, plants for sandy soils, you'll find loads. Um, so the best type of soil to have is loam. So loam um, 
it basically grow lets you grow most things. It's a mix of all the three types of soil I've mentioned. So it's roughly a 40 to 40 to 20 percent mix of sand, silt and clay respectively. Uh, and loam soil basically provides the benefits of all the three soil types. So you'll have soil aeration, aeration and water infiltration from sand, which will be balanced with water retention from clay and silt. And you also have the nutrient retention from clay. Uh, as you can see in the diagram and the, the bottom bit shows you what loam soil would roughly look like. Um, so before I start talking about how to improve soil health, I think it's important to talk about the important things that soils do for the world. Um, so soils obviously are a medium in which we grow our crops. It's what we rely on. on uh, it's what we rely on for our food. It's what we rely on to grow crops for natural fibers to make clothes, and it's how most vegetation grows that provides habitats and food for our wildlife. Um, healthy soils should also be able to filter water. So with peatland, peatland soils are apparently very, very good at this. And this can happen through soil particles literally blocking any big particles from passing through as the water moves through the soil. And also you'll have microorganisms that will break down any organic matter in the water and kind of get rid of it, clean it up that way. Um, soils also provide flood resilience. So soils and high organic matter have a lot of air spaces. So because of this, the soil can act like a sponge which then provides resilience to floods and heavy rains. And soils are also incredibly important in our fight with climate change. So a fun statistic I found is that uh, the Earth's soils contain about 2,500 gigatons, gigatons of carbon, which is more than three times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and four times the amount of carbon stored in all living plants and animals. So that's an insane amount of carbon stored just in our soils. And the way carbon is stored in the soil is that as, thi as things are decomposed in the soil and, and they, they get break broken down into their primary components, uh, some of that stuff will be broken down into carbon because carbon is the building block of life and we are all made of it uh, in one way or another. And that carbon can then stay in the soil rather than entering our atmosphere because once the carbon enters the atmosphere, it will meet oxygen and from that you get CO2, carbon dioxide, which is the greenhouse gas that is uh, largely responsible for climate change. Um, yes, yeah, so carbon uh, sequestration just refers to the act of locking up this carbon from the atmosphere, removing it from the atmosphere where it's acting as a greenhouse gas and putting it back in the soil where it's just not really doing much. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and with the way the world is right now, with all the destructive agricultural practices, with the use of pesticides, deforestation, our soils are quite threatened and so are these functions that they provide. So now let's talk about what we can do for the soils in our own gardens, because if, even if you're doing just a small bit to help the soils, that's still very, very you know great. It's more than enough. So building, um, yeah, improving soil health. So if in doubt, add compost. So like I said earlier, if you have clay or sandy soils, you can improve them with compost, which you can either dig in or add on top. Um, clay and sandy soils may need more compost than loamy soils, just because, you know, because of all the <laughs> disadvantages that I mentioned earlier. Um, but even with loam soils, you want to add compost every single year to replenish all the nutrients that your plants are taking out. And the way this process happens in nature is that, for example, trees will lose their leaves in the autumn, all the leaves will fall down to the bottom of that tree and they'll decompose at the bottom and kind of return nutrients to that tree. So we're, tr we're trying to mimic that basically. And you can make compost yourself. So I did a talk on that a few months ago, which we can send you a link to. Um, yeah, or you can also buy it. Uh, I recommend doing it yourself because it's fun. Um, another way of improving soil health is, is using the no dig method. So this has been popularized lately by a, a guy called Charles Dowding, but it's actually been used by Peruvian farmers for a very long time. So this is a method that's been around for a while. And this basic, basically refers to building on existing soil. So this is a method that saves you a lot of work because you don't have to dig any compost into the soil. You don't have to dig anything over. You just add stuff on top. And this is also good for carbon sequestration because when you dig 
dig up your soil, you're exposing any carbon in that soil to the oxygen in the atmosphere, which can then form the CO2, which we don't really want. But if you're not digging up your soil, then obviously you're avoiding that. Um, this method is also good because it doesn't disturb any soil organisms that have established themselves in the soil, so any fungal networks will remain intact. But if your soil is super, super bad, I'd say dig it up once and then don't dig it up again, you know, so like do it once, but do it right. Uh, yeah, work in loads of compost and just make sure that, you know, you don't have to dig it up again. Um, and the way this method is done, there's probably a variety of ways you can do it, but the main, uh, the, the basic method is that you would lay down cardboard on any existing vegetation that will be to suppress that vegetation, kind of kill it off. Then next you would add leaf, lit, uh, leaf mulch or straw or compost or something like that. And then the final layer would be, yeah, just a lot of compost, which then you can plant your plants in. Next we have mulch. The mulch refers to any material that you add around your plants, which acts to prevent water from evaporating. So it maintains moisture around your plant. And this also prevents soil erosion because it's covering the soil and um, because of this, the nutrients in that soil are less likely to be carried away by any heavy rain or other disturbance. Mulch can also suppress weeds and I guess it, it can also say that it adds some nutrients to the soil as the mulch is slowly broken down. And for mulch, you can use leaf mulch, you can use straw, you can use wood chips, but do you remember that when you apply mulch, make sure that it's not in contact in, in not oh, sorry <laughs> make sure it's not in contact with the plant stem because that can cause it to rot so next we've got um using cover crops or green manure which are kind of similar to mulch um so cover crops refer to crops that you grow purely to cover the soil rather than to harvest them and use them for anything else so for example in the winter if you're not growing any vegetables rather than leaving your soil bare, you might want to use cover crops instead. So similarly to mulch, the cover crops prevent soil erosion because they cover the soil. Um, oh yeah, and as you can see in this photo, um, that the bits of the, uh, the bits that have vegetation grown in them, the soil isn't being washed away when there's, uh, when there's water poured over that bit of soil. But we, when you look at the bits where it's just bare soil, when water's poured over that, you can see how much soil comes out. So this just kind of shows you how important it is to have this vegetation there to prevent soil erosion. Um, yeah, also these cover crops, they will add nutrients to the soil. So if you're planting things like nitrogen, uh, nitrogen fixing plants like clover or alfalfa, these, uh, yeah, these will, you know, add nutrients to your soil. And they can also prevent soil compaction because rather than leaving your soil bare, to be you know, walked over where it's going to be impacted by heavy rain and it will get compacted over time. Instead, you've got plants that have their roots kind of breaking up the soil. So you don't have to worry about that. And uh, these cover crops will also suppress weeds. So they are less of an issue next time you want to grow stuff in that spot. <coughs> and that's just a nice photo of uh, what cover crops can look like. And yeah, also green manures that reflect seed cover crops that are actually dug into the ground that act like a living fertilizer almost. So instead of kind of collecting all of that, uh, all of those crops and throwing them in your compost pile, you can actually dig them directly into the soil where they will uh, add nutrients to it. Um, yes. OK, next you've got <coughs> going organic. Uh, so this could be like a whole presentation on its own. Um, I feel like most people will be aware of what being organic, like, uh, growing in an organic way means, but it just basically means don't use any artificial fertilizers or pesticides. These things are so incredibly bad for our environment. They pollute both our soils and our waters. They can stay in the environment for long periods of time. They can combine together into like these chemical cocktails. Just like don't use them and whatever issue you're having, there will always be an organic way of dealing with that. Or you just kind of have to accept that your garden isn't just for you to enjoy and there will always be some kind of animal or insect that will be enjoying the garden with you. Um, but there are also a variety of organic pesticides that you can use that are less harmful to the wider environment. Or there's also something called companion planting that you can use to manage any pest issues. 
um, which I recommend you look into. Um, and a great book on this is uh, Silent Spring, written by Rachel Carson. She wrote a book about pesticide use in America in the 70s. And it was like a, an incredible book that did a lot for the environmental movement. And uh, yeah, it's the first book I read at uni and it's the reason why I'm here talking to you about this stuff. It's great and I recommend it. Um, and the last bit that you can do is um, use raised garden beds. So if if your soil is like super, super bad. So for example, in Man I live in Manchester and a few years ago I lived in a house where the garden, the soil in the garden was incredibly thin and it was just rubble. It was a lot of rocks and stones, so I couldn't really grow anything in it. So what I could have done instead, I could have just built the soil up instead. And this is also a good solution if your soil is really polluted in like some kind of heavy metal or whatever. But if your soil is polluted with anything, um, I would definitely contact the professional to advise you how to deal with that. And also, this is a good option for people that don't like to bend down too much when gardening. So that's that's good. Um, yeah, so that's that's all I have to say today. Um, but there's there's a lot of I feel like I could say a lot more on every single slide that I went through. There's a lot more that I can talk about. So I was just wondering. Uh, I have a list of topics here that I'd love to talk about at some point. So if people are interested in these, please let us know uh, in the chat or in the little feedback box at the end of this talk. Or if there's any ideas you have on your own, um, please let us know what you'd like to see next. And yeah, if you want to stay in touch, uh, this is my Instagram and my blog. And then also the community garden that I volunteer at, Platfields Market Garden. There's a Facebook for that and a website. Um, yeah, I'm I'm done. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was great. There you go. Um, so I'll, I'll just go back through the chat box um, to see what questions people have asked or what, um, what information people have shared. And please, while we're talking just now, if you uh, have any more questions, just ask. We'll try to get through them all. And if not, we will um, we can maybe answer them in the follow up email. Uh, lots of questions about composting and things and what I'll say is um, it might be best just to go and watch the composting, vermicomposting and composting webinar that Claudia did a few weeks ago. Yeah. I'll put a link to that in the chat but I'll also send it through in the email afterwards. About different soil types as well, I was asking people what soil types they have mm -hmm. and um, uh, Tenny from Belgium uh, says that the soil type they have there is mostly sandy and clay due to mm -hmm. the fact that it's lots of regions near the sea. Um, I was going to ask, Cardi, I know there's ways to test the kind of soil that you have. Um, it's things like using water and trying to boil it up to check if it is a clay soil. And can, can you give us maybe a, do you know much about that? Can you give us a... Um, honestly, it's... Thing? It's a topic that I'm still kind of exploring myself just now. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to do some soil tests this weekend, actually. But there is, there is something. Uh, there are there's loads of videos that, that are online that we can uh, link people to. There are there is something you can do when you collect soil. You put it in a jar and you let it sit for a while, and then it kind of divides itself into like clay, silt, and sands. And then what you can do with that, uh, there's a thing called the textural the triangle, which I didn't include in this because it's more relevant to soil testing and we're not talking about that today but there's this triangle that you can use to basically calculate what soil type you have exactly based on how much silt clay and sand you have because you have like intermediate soil types like sandy loamy clay and loamy silt and stuff like that so yeah um, yeah <clears throat> it might be helpful for people i suppose if they have no idea what kind of soil they have maybe that's the first step um and then they can go on from there and use some of the tips that you've you've given yes true, true very true well um, i'd love to do a talk on soil testing as well next so you never know mm, yeah <laughs> so much stuff about oh, so much um here's a question from alan who says for a no dig method with poor soil conditions how deep should you initially remove the old soil and replace with compost or organic matter so with with, with no dig you're not supposed to dig so you wouldn't dig anything, you would just build straight on top of that soil. So yeah, just place down, place some cardboard down, 
add some straw or leaf mulch and then compost on top and that's that's it there's no digging involved it's, it's all about improving what's there isn't it rather than removing anything yeah yeah exactly yeah it, it, it's what we use at platfield's market garden and we've got loads of great produce from it so it, it does work <laughs> yeah what's i was going to ask about the time scales as well for some of these things i mean some of the, what are maybe some of the faster options for improving soil versus some of the slower options? Yeah, so the, the fastest would be definitely, like I mentioned, just building on top of it, because then you're essentially just kind of growing in pure compost. So if you lay down, you know, a few inches of compost and you're growing in that, and that's that's great because you're not exactly growing in that poor soil underneath, if that makes sense. Whereas I read that if you, <clears throat> and I've heard from people as well, that if you try and, if you have like really heavy clay soils, for example, and you're trying to dig in organic matter into that every single year, like it takes years and years and years to see any improvement. Yeah. So yeah, <clears throat> save yourself, oh God, sorry. <clears throat> save yourself the work and just build on top, <laughs> I'd say. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, yes, people ask about, DIY soil testing, so we'll, um, we'll send through some information on that. Um, Tim Boy from the Philippines saying that he that raised beds or plots are really effective there because they avoid the destructive effects of floods, mm -hmm. which is um, something that's going to be happening more and more now. Isn't it? Melanie says, how many days does, do, does it last when you apply organic matter to soils? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it depends on what you add. So, for example, I don't know the actual details of this, but I know that, for example, if you add cow manure or chicken manure or worm castings, like those all last a different amount of time. So I think worm castings I read somewhere are quite uh, like they're a fast release fertilizer. So the, the, the nutrients in them must get used up really quickly, whereas there are some other types of compost where it last a bit longer but i'm not sure how many days exactly but um i know that that the, the the rule the general rule is that you just want to add compost every single year i think in mm -hmm. spring right yeah yeah <clears throat> um uh jimbo is asking about how effective well, it is um composting rotten vegetables and integrating them back into the garden again that's yeah that's an interesting one um um i think i read somewhere that if if so if you have like let's say you've got a garden bed that you're not going to use for a while so let's say it's january you're not really growing anything yet um i would yeah i would dig in some food scraps in there because yeah they will get broken down definitely with time but i also read that you don't want to plant stuff into that bed whilst that stuff is being broken down because there can be an issue with nutrient av av availability because you have all these microbes breaking down all these um, all, th all this food and as they do that they kind of use up a bunch of nutrients that then aren't available to the plant if that makes sense so mm -hmm. you kind of need like a bit of land where you're not growing anything and wait a few months for the stuff to break down and then plant into it but I think that that's definitely you know a, a fun way to get rid of your food waste. Mm -hmm. Mariel says here in the Philippines we do organic farming to maintain the nutrients of soil. Sounds hey. a good idea. Uh, Riza asks, what's, what is the most accurate way to measure, measure the pH of soil? Oh God, you know what, I've been, I've been trying to find this out for the past few weeks. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of pH testing equipment online and it all has such mixed reviews. You've got mm. like electronic probes that you stick in, but some people say they don't work and some people are like, yeah, yeah I love it, blah, blah. Then you've got pH strips, which again, people are kind of not, they're not agreeing on if, if they're good or bad. What I want to try this weekend at Platfields, uh, I want to try the, the very, very DIY method of using cabbage and some, what was it like, vinegar and baking soda. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. It doesn't give you the exact pH, but it just tells you if it's you know acidic, basic, or alkaline. So I'm interested in trying that. Um, but yeah, honestly, I'm not too sure. Like as as far as I'm aware at the moment, the best thing you can do is to send your results to a lab. But obviously, that costs money, and not everyone has access to that. So yeah, I'm still trying to find out. <laughs> is adding humic 
humic acid slash powder based products to soil necessary or will compost be okay do you know anything about humic acid and powder um no that's the first time i've heard of humic powder. Yeah, me too. um humic i mean it, it sounds like stuff that you'd find in compost anyway mm. because you know humic acid hummus hummus that you find in a compost so like to me like i feel like there's never much point in adding any extra products to your compost i feel like your compost should be enough yeah um, um more local um yeah i'm sure this there's, there's <laughs> i'm sure there's loads of stuff out there and loads of people trying to sell you all sorts of products yeah yeah mm -hmm. like the, the thing there's a product which, which is like a compost starter or something which is like i don't know bacteria that's supposed to kickstart your compost but like like they, they'll come in their own time you know they'll, they'll come anyway you don't have to buy that stuff yeah yeah uh, oh so just something from jim Boyer here as part of our city's program on urban container growing many people are using recyclable materials um is there a deleterious big words effect with the soil reaction to the containers use example uh styrofoam well this is kind of yeah using things like i know sometimes people use tires to grow in mm. or they'll um, make beds out of pallets um and things like that so i guess over time those things could leach into the soil that's yeah. maybe what is getting at um yeah like so... some because some wooden pallets they're, they're they've been treated with pesticides so obviously you wouldn't want to use those and like wooden pallets they tend to have different markings depending on how they were treated so like heat treated will have a heat treated pallet will have the letters ht on it and that's what you'd rather use rather than mm. like one sprayed with anything um and yeah and also I've, I've heard the tires are really really bad for growing stuff in mm. um so i think yeah, that i would choose if i was going to use tires and things like that i would um grow decorative things in them mm -hmm. rather yeah, than yeah. fresh fruit and vegetables <clears throat> um and, yeah and also if growing in any like plastic containers and stuff i feel like it's not the best way to go because plastic will with time it will just fall apart into smaller and smaller bits of plastic and then they'll just contribute to the microplastic issue and also we still don't know what chemicals uh, the plastics are leaching out everywhere and we don't know what effects that's having on uh, on our health and the wider environment so yeah i'd avoid mm. working with plastics yeah <clears throat> um again it's talking about moringa do you know moringa is apparently a superfood plant in uh, I guess no. um he's Sounds talking about yeah talking about growing it alongside roads and things do you know much about um how growing alongside roads can influence plants and soil and uh, you know pollution yeah a, l a little bit so th there's always the risk of because obviously trees will or like any plants they absorb oxygen through their leaves right but this also means that when this oxygen is going into the leaves, there's also space for other things to enter the leaves. So like any uh, PM10, PM2.5, uh, like all the all these particles, any like uh, nitrous oxide, any of the horrible stuff that's coming out of cars, it can enter your plant. And then that can have some kind of negative effect on it. And, you know, I'm not too sure what exactly would happen, but I, I wouldn't personally feel too comfortable eating fruit from something that's grown so close to a road just because of the potential pollution in that fruit um mm -hmm. i can't remember the number now but i think it's like up to is that between 250 meters like the pollution from a road can travel up to uh between 50 to 200 meters away from a road does that make any sense <laughs> yeah it kind of gives you a rough yeah. idea of uh how far you should be away from roads yeah and yeah. then there's also the potential of like any stuff from uh car tires being like it that stuff wearing away and then entering the soils and stuff like that so if you're gonna grow anything by a road yeah just maybe like something decorative would be better than something that you'd actually eat yeah great okay i think we'll wrap up now um thank you so much claudia and it's all been very informative and uh we've had a great turnout today um as we were saying if you have uh any more to talk about any preferences with these um topics here or anything else 
that you'd like to see presentations on. Uh, we'd love to get Claudia back to run more. Um, <laughs> and um, I think we, I mean, we haven't planned our next block yet, but we'll, we'll see how things go and how lockdown is here and all these kinds of things. But um, thanks for logging on everyone. Yeah, it's, it's um, been a pleasure talking to you all. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. Great to have such an international cast. Um, uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll see you all next time and look out for the email that I'll send through, a follow-up email. Okay, thanks, Claudia. Thanks, yeah, thanks. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. Okay, yeah. Bye. See ya.